April 9, 1997. It is perhaps the most significant discovery in the annals of space exploration. The bottom line is it's about life. Make no mistake about it, the discovery of life on another planet will rival any other discovery that takes pla has taken place in the history of human culture. These pictures from the space probe Galileo show what's believed to be an ocean of water on the Jovian moon Europa, an ocean containing the ingredients necessary for life as we know it. Many of us believe that a, that a planetary ocean is a, a kind of a planetary nursery, if you will, a, 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 an incubator within which life not only may be sustained, but it may actually originate. Tonight, the possibility of life in outer space. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. One of these days, I hope to be able to begin a program like this without all the qualifiers. You know, come right out and say it. They found it. They've taken videotape of it. They're bringing it back home. I'm not altogether clear what it will be, but it won't matter as long as it's still alive and if its place of origin was somewhere out there beyond the Earth's atmosphere. That is not quite what we've got this evening. Although the scientists who've been studying the evidence are quite ecstatic. Last February, the space probe Galileo flew within 363 miles of Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. The images that were sent back suggest conditions that could support certain lower forms of life. It is hardly a new concept. Seventeen years ago, the idea that there might be life on Europa beneath its ice-covered oceans was put forward by space researcher Richard Hoagland. Let's put it this way. Every image that Galileo's cameras have sent back to Earth enhances the likelihood that the theories may be correct. Ned Potter has the story on today's development. Scientists always spoke of the cold wastes around Jupiter, where everything, it seemed, must be frozen. But Galileo, making one pass and then another at the moon Europa, found evidence of just the opposite, something for which those same scientists had always held out hope. The streaks on its icy surface hinted that somewhere beneath was liquid water. It looks as though we have found the smoking gun with respect to that's pointing right at this uh, subsurface ocean. A subsurface ocean. Today at a NASA briefing, scientists told why they believe they have found the first liquid water anywhere beyond Earth. They pointed at the cracks in Europa's outer crust. If you watch the red arrow, you see how some of them have shifted. In other views, ice chunks have obviously broken apart and been turned in different directions. The best explanation? Europa's surface is being tugged and turned by tides down below. And traction from below implies currents, it implies movement, and it implies a, a liquid down below. If the majority of Europa's ice crust is melted, liquid, and, and these very, very thin rafts probably indicate that that's the case, then there's more liquid water on Europa than there are on all the oceans of the Earth. So here's the picture that results of this distant moon. On the outside, a layer of ice that may be miles thick. On the inside, a rocky core, and between them, slush or water. From there, they take it a step further. Something must be keeping Europa's water from freezing. Perhaps volcanic activity. Perhaps something much like the vents that have been found deep in the Earth's oceans. And now let us add one more ingredient. The chemical compounds that are the basic building blocks of life. Scientists believe they may be present on Europa, too, perhaps deposited there by comets that crashed into the surface over the eons. Put all those things together, water, heat, organic compounds, and you are led to a fundamental question. 600 million miles from the sun, could there actually be life in the oceans of Europa? I don't think we're in a position to say if there's life on Europa at this point or not. Uh, it really comes down to the question of of the building blocks for life and the environment for life. And when we look throughout the solar system, Europa is one of the places, one of the few places, where all of these things come together uh, to, to make a conducive environment for life. 
Most scientists share that caution, but Europa may someday settle a fundamental debate. How does life form? Does something special have to happen to create the abundance we see on Earth? Or does life pop up anywhere if some basic conditions are right? Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson directs New York's Hayden Planetarium and is an astronomer at Princeton. It's tempting to actually believe that life might be inevitable just by the combination of those ingredients. It certainly happened on Earth, and it happened all over the surface. We look forward to other places in the solar system to see what they bring. Many scientists will fully admit that for all their caution, they're also thrilled tonight. For years, they have scanned the universe for life and would be delighted to find it. Oceanographer John Delaney was at today's briefing. What my personal beliefs are is probably irrelevant. But the answer is, I'm sure there's life there. <laughs> Perhaps a future probe will prove him right. This is Ned Potter for Nightline. When we come back, we'll be joined by the man who decides where NASA's space probes are sent, and by a geologist and an astronomer who believe one of those probes should be sent to Europa. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Charles Schwab. This is ABC News Looking for historically high-performing mutual funds? You'll find lots of them and more right here. Mutual Fund One Source from Schwab. 600 funds, no loads. Call for the select list free or get it all online at schwab.com right now. This is investing the way it should be. It moves with grace. Effortless. It is the American-built flagship of Toyota. With a spacious interior and all the roominess of an endless horizon. Avalon, experience the tranquility. Who is Timothy McVeigh? Exclusive interviews with close friends and family members who've spoken to no one else. I thought right out loud, what in hell was he doing in Oklahoma? Startling new information on the eve of his trial for the Oklahoma City bombing. Peter Jennings reporting Thursday on ABC. Here are some of the needs in our area. Technology Access Center assists those with disabilities in acquiring technology devices for use in daily life. It needs building materials for expanding its facility. Catholic Charities of Tennessee is in need of a television for a single full-time working mother of two who is also mentally challenged. The YWCA Triangle House needs twin-size sheets, towels, and alarm clocks for its female residential program. The National Humane Association needs leashes, collars, food bowls, pet toys, pet food, laundry detergent, and bleach. Coon Adult Community Education needs a fax machine, typewriter, washer, dryer, office supplies, and greeting cards. If you are a nonprofit agency with needs, write WKRN at this address or call 298-9801. Joining us now live from our Los Angeles Bureau, Ronald Greeley is a professor of geology at Arizona State University. He is also a member of Galileo's imaging team. Wes Huntress directs all of NASA's unmanned space efforts, including the Hubble Telescope, Mars missions, and the Galileo probe. He joins us from our Washington studios, as does Richard Berenson, who is a professor of physics and astronomy at American University. Professor Greeley, as long ago as... 1982. Arthur C. Clarke was speculating in, in 2010 that there might be life beneath the oceans on Galileo. How much further along are we today than that speculation of 15 years ago? Well, I think the exciting thing that uh, we see in the data that were released today is clear evidence that liquid water has existed on and near the surface of Europa. 
And that means what? I mean, I, I thought even that had been speculated. You're now saying that is, that is a certainty now? We can, we can take that as a given? The evidence is pretty clear that liquid water was released onto the surface and that in other places it was extremely close to the surface. That's the, uh, that's the result today, yes. And what was it in those images that came back that allow you now to conclude that with certainty? Well, we see very smooth patches that have flooded the surface and the only reasonable explanation for those smooth patches is a liquid of some kind and the best candidate is water. In other places we see blocks of ice that have shifted from their original position into new positions and they must have been lubricated by something. Again, the reasonable candidate is liquid water and from the size and spacing of the blocks, the water must have been very close to the surface, uh, and, and perhaps it, a mile or so. And is it fair to conclude that if you've got water under very thick ice, and, and the ice is in places, I gather, miles thick, it's then reasonable to conclude that there has to be some kind of heat beneath that water, otherwise it too would be ice, wouldn't it? Yes, that's exactly right. And if we are considering the question of life, there are really the three factors that have to be considered. Water, heat and the right kind of chemistry, organic compounds. And you, and don't, you don't have that evidence? I mean, you don't have that third part of it yet, do you? We don't have the chemistry directly, but uh, I think it's widely believed that organic compounds are spread throughout the solar system, both through meteoritic impact and from comets. And it's reasonable to suspect that that same material has been implanted on the surface of Europa. Dr. Huntress, is there really any question in your mind but that NASA should send a probe uh, to Europa? Oh, I think it's clear, especially after uh, the Galileo results, and we expect more to come in the next several years uh, from Galileo flybys, uh, that Europa should be a prime target for uh, some of our next missions uh, to the outer solar system. What, what, is it that a, what is it that a probe could do? In other words, could, can you land a, a probe on Europa? Well, you can land or you can orbit uh, Europa. Galileo spacecraft is in orbit around Jupiter uh, and makes occasional flybys of Europa. The next step for Europa would probably be to send an orbiter of Europa in order to map the entire moon looking for uh, evidence of that uh, subterranean ocean and trying to find out where it might exist uh, at the present time. Just put things a little bit into context for us. How long did it take Galileo to get out there to Jupiter? Well, it took Galileo about six years of travel uh, to get out uh, to Jupiter. Galileo is a very heavy, very large spacecraft. Uh, we can build them smaller and lighter these days uh, and uh, fire them out directly towards Jupiter. And, and they could get out there quickly. The, the shortest travel time is on the order of two years. Uh, in, in terms of just budgetary constraints and, and getting the permission to go ahead with this, kind of a com uh, with this kind of a mission, how long do you think it would take? Well, that's, that's probably the thing that would take the longest, is, is to get the uh, approval. But we do have plans now, uh, in fact, and, and the administration, in fact, has put forward a plan uh, that would include a series of missions uh, to the outer planets beginning in about uh, two to three years uh, from now. Uh, and so we'll probably one of the first of those uh, could be a mission that went to Europa with a launch sometime around uh, 02 or 03. Professor Berenson, I, I, you and I have known each other for a long time. I rarely see you happier than on a day like today. You're like a kid with a, with a new gift that uh, he's just beginning to unwrap. Uh, what is it that so excites you about these kinds of discoveries? Oh, it's absolutely stunning. We'd expected this for a long time. As you mentioned, Arthur C. Clarke wrote about it, and it was in the film, 2010. But then again, it's something else to find pretty compelling evidence that there really is liquid water underneath that ice, and the ice is rather thin. And what is more, between the cracks where sunlight can come down, there's probably prebiotic material. Now, we, of course, have all been marveling at this comet, Hale-Bopp. What is the comet? Well, it's an iceberg and it has dust in it. Well, that is the very water that you and I drink and we ourselves are composed of water. In a way, it's an old ancestor come back to visit. It also has carbon in it. We know that the Earth has been pounded by such objects. Undoubtedly, Europa has. So probably some of the building blocks of life itself are on Europa even now. And this is a confirmation. I think that the search has just begun. But we, we, we could be talking about a 
a form of life or at least the chemistry being in place and the conditions being right for an evolutionary process that could take several million years before we get to the most elementary form of life. Well, that's right, but that's fine. That's quite exciting. It would be one of the stunning discoveries of all time. We're now realizing that there are extremophiles here on Earth, things which can live in boiling water, they can live in acid, live in base conditions, they can live in volcanic plumes, they can live where we thought no life could survive at all. It's ironic that in 1979, the Voyager craft flew by and looked at Europa. It also looked at the moon Io, a volcanic place. And then one year later, we found volcanoes on the bottom of the oceans here on Earth, and we found that there was life there. We even found that they bilched out a great deal of life from underneath the surface of the ocean. We realized that there's more mass in the form of bacteria in the planet than there is all of the life that we see around us. Most of the living things in our planet, we don't see at all. They're really quite small and they're subterranean. Why shouldn't we imagine that there could also be that kind of microbial life elsewhere? Uh, on that fascinating note, let's take a short break and we'll come back to that in just a moment. We'll be back with more in just a moment. To you, it looks like this. To a car thief, it looks like this. And to our Ford Motor Company engineers, it looks like one of the most powerful anti-theft devices ever. Only this key sends an electronic code to the engine before it will ever start. So it looks like your new Taurus will be just where you parked it. Ford. Quality is job one. Introducing new Hellman salad dressing. Tom, I love you, but it's over. Here goes. Tom, I love you, but... Mm, mm, mm. I know. I could taste it in this homemade dressing. No, no, no. I didn't make it. Hellman's made the dressing. Now I know how much you care. You do? I don't. You've really fallen hard, huh? Hellman's made it. Mm. Now Hellman's makes ten delicious dressings, four fat-free, with the fresh taste of homemade. This is love. No, this is Hellman's. New Hellman's, the freshest tasting salad dressing you never made. Tonight on FBI, can a woman actually cry her way to the top? Crying works once with a guy. You cry twice, and you're a neurotic. Politically Incorrect, coming up on ABC Late Night. When news breaks. We now go live to the scene of the investigation. See it live on News 2. News 2, first in the scene of breaking news. First with live coverage. First with a story. News 2, bringing you complete coverage of all the day's news. Plus, keeping you ahead of severe weather with the exclusive Storm Tracker 2000. When news breaks, see it live on News 2, where coverage comes first every day. Good thing you came to Lowe's Home Improvement Warehouse, because it's a jungle in here. These aren't aisles, they're trails. Vegetative geraniums grown from cuttings, not seed. They're fuller, more blooms, more color, and oh, the fragrance of a low price. It's intoxicating. <laughs> Sure, we're passionate about lawns and gardens, but we're just as passionate about low prices. Why do you think we're called Lowe's? More begonia for your buck. <laughs> just thought of that. When it comes to home improvement, Lowe's knows. When severe weather threatens, seconds count. Now with the exclusive Storm Tracker 2000, News 2 will keep you ahead of the storm. This is amazing new technology. Storm Tracker 2000 narrows in on severe weather while it's happening right down to one square block. What does this mean for you? Earlier warnings with pinpoint accuracy so you and your family stay safe. Storm Tracker 2000 exclusively on News 2. And we're back live with geologist Ronald Greeley, NASA Associate Administrator Wes Huntress, and astronomer Richard Berenson. Professor Greeley, fantasize for me for a moment. You've got all the money you want. You can design any mission that you want. What are you looking for? How are you going to send it out there? What are you going to bring back? Well, let's go. Let's go to the surface. Let's uh, drill through that ice. Let's get into the subsurface, into the liquid water, and see what's there. Uh, and the sooner the better. You know, we're about halfway through the data takes for Galileo. We still have another close encounter that is a close flyby of Europa coming up. And every time we look at Europa now, we see new and exciting things. Uh, we're looking forward to getting new data and seeing if the same sort of, of uh, ice and water-rich surface is found in other places too. 
We also want to see if there are places that are currently active. So far, we don't really know if that liquid water and ice is, is near the surface and active today. But during the rest of the Galileo mission, we want to search for local activity. We want to see if there have been changes that have occurred on the surface. All of these things would give us good clues as to the nature of the interior. So you ask me what I'd like to do. I want to, I want to go back. I want to see more. I don't want to get below the surface. Do we have the capacity to, to do that, Dr. Huntress? Do we have the capacity to land a probe? Uh, on, uh, on the moon and quite literally drill through the ice. I mean, I, I, I hear uh, Professor Berenson, for example, talking about the relatively thin ice. I, I think some of it is several miles thick, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but that doesn't daunt us very much at all. I, I think we do have the capability to do that. And in fact, uh, we're going to define a program uh, with our sister agency, National Science Foundation, uh, work on it this summer uh, to plan to actually try something very similar to that in Antarctica because there are deep lakes that we've just recently discovered in, an, in uh, Antarctica uh, and uh, we're going to look work on a program where we can drill down to these lakes probably haven't seen the light of day for millions of years uh, and to insert probes uh, through those uh, holes uh, to swim around uh, in those lakes and try to understand what's what's there and that would be great practice for a mission like that uh, to Europa. Uh, on the other hand, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask Ron if, if we shouldn't go back first with an orbiter in order to find out if in fact uh, there is extensive oceans and where they are so we know where to drill before we go land on the surface. And let me add uh, as, as part of that question and go ahead Professor Greeley answer that one and, and uh, tack this onto it. Uh, is time of the essence at all? I mean, we're dealing here with millions of years, but the human lifetime is relatively short. You want to see the results, don't you? Well, I'd like to see the results, certainly. And yes, we certainly want to go back and fly that orbiter and find the best places to land. Uh, the landing and drilling through the ice would be a very ambitious undertaking. It's important that we go to the right place or the right places. And to do that, we really need to get a good global view of Europa and identify the most promising places to, to send the probes and the landers. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Berenson, you've raised, uh, in, in fact, several of you this evening have raised the sort of tantalizing prospect that we haven't really begun to explore our own planet. That there are things that are happening beneath the surface of the ocean, for example, uh, that contains so much knowledge, so much information that we didn't even know was there 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, should, we be, should we be looking way out there when we haven't yet finished exploring our own place? No, I think what we have to do is both. It's a collaboration. It's a collaboration of astronomers with oceanographers and geologists and microbiologists and others. What we really do is compare our planet with others. For the first time in human history, we have the capacity for comparative planetology. We can compare and contrast the Earth, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and others. And we didn't mention the Mars meteorite of last summer. I think what we're increasingly finding is potential life sites, and my guess is that within our lifetimes, we will definitively find it. Definitively find it. Now, uh, again, what is it in this I case? I think in this case, it might well be microbial life. It might well be microbial life in our own solar system. True, that's not evolved. It's not as exciting as in a science fiction film, but... If you then realize that there's hundreds of billions of stars within our own galaxy, hundreds of billions of other galaxies, we're already finding planets outside of our own system. The potentiality elsewhere is staggering. Professor Greeley, I'm, I'm still seized with this notion of something that is how many million miles away? Oh, goodness, uh, it, it varies, but it's a long way. A yes. long, all right, it's, <laughs> it's way out there, and we're going to send a probe out there, and how are you going to dig through several miles of ice? Uh, I mean, forgive me for seizing on that point, but it's perhaps the only thing that I'm really sure I understand here. <laughs> well, given enough time, and I'm sure Wes can, can speak to this as well, but uh, almost certainly it would have to be some sort of heat probe. In other words, we'd melt our way through the ice crust to get into the subsurface. And how yeah, in fact, we've, we've done this on, uh, in, in Antarctica, too, so we know how to do it. And, and ice is the easiest of things to, to drill for. Oh, I'm, sure we, I'm sure we can do it here, but I'm just assuming that it's a little more difficult to do something like that by remote control from several hundred million miles away. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a few million miles. 
I'm sure we can figure out how to do that. It's, and uh, to do it robotically. Uh, and we're going to get practice in doing that as we go to the surfaces of all the planets in the solar system uh, to explore them remotely. And, and what do you do? I'm all right, fine. I, I accept your, your assurance that we can drill through the ice. So you drill through the ice and you bring out water samples and bring them back to Earth? I think the first thing you would do is actually deploy a little swimming robot. Uh, that would uh, swim through this ocean and uh, measure the chemical constituents of the ocean, do imaging to try to see what might perhaps be swimming through it, if, any, if anything was, examine the, the, the bottom. Uh, kind of a very miniature version of the Alvin submarine that we're all familiar with, for example, that, that, uh, that explored the Titanic. And I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to keep asking these stupid practical questions. And how do you get that little sucker back through the hole and get it out again and back on a spacecraft well, and back to Earth? Or, well, or don't, you, don't you bother? The first time, we probably don't do that. Uh, and we just uh, explore uh, the planet remotely and don't attempt to bring anything and back. And can we, you actually send signals back from beneath a couple of miles of ice? Oh yes, I think that's, that, that's, uh, that we can do. Even if it means uh, trailing a wire back through the hole to an antenna on the top. Well, gentlemen, I'm, I'm in awe of your, your optimism, your enthusiasm, and I'm, I'm sure everything that you want to have happen will, as long as there are people like you behind it. Thanks so much for being with us, Professor Greeley, Professor Berenson, Dr. Huntress. Good of you to join us. I'll be back in a moment. Anybody out there? Anybody out there? Of course not. I'm Highway 50, the loneliest road in America. No sights, no shops, nothing but asphalt. The road is calling, and the 200 horsepower V6 ES300 will help you answer it. Oh, now, traffic jam. Last year, Americans bought over 4 million back massagers, thousands of vibrating chairs, and so many things that look like this and this that we wonder if some people aren't sleeping on the wrong mattress. We'd recommend a Sealy Posturepedic sleep system, slept on by more people than any other mattress, including more orthopedic surgeons. Posturepedic support, only from Sealy. <laughs> Yesterday I got a call from a long distance company asking me if I'd like to switch my local phone service. I had some questions of my own. Are they making investments so the latest technology goes to all communities? Last year, local phone companies invested $20 billion in the local network, including $2 billion to bring technology to our schools. Are AT&T and MCI willing to make that commitment? When they call the sell you local service, call them on it. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Every day at News 2, we start with a commitment to bring you the best coverage of the day's news. We strive to help educate, inform, and inspire solutions to the problems that face all of us. That's why we've developed Need to Know, a year-round commitment to help make a difference throughout Middle Tennessee. When you see the Need to Know symbol, it indicates special community projects and partnerships designed to help you and your family. Covering the issues you need to know, it's another reason News 2 is where coverage comes first. And finally, a program note. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, is your privacy compromised on the Internet? From unlisted numbers to credit ratings, how easy is it for others to gain access to your personal information? That'll be on GMA tomorrow morning. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. If you'd like a transcript or video cassette of this or any other edition of Nightline, please call 1-800-913-3434. Nightline is online with America Online. AOL members use the keyword ABC News.
Nightline is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.